I'm Archie Clutter. I'm Dean of the Agricultural Research Division here at the University of Nebraska, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this panel discussion of emerging technologies in agriculture, especially relating to the efficient use of water and food production. Two strong and reoccurring themes at this conference over the years have been driven by the recognition that meeting those great challenges of global food security will require, first of all, transdisciplinary systems approaches, not only to the science behind the technology, but to the development and delivery of that technology. And secondly, that it will require creative, collaborative partnerships within and across the public and private sectors. So we're fortunate today to have brought together a panel of individuals who are, are working uh, and have expertise on the forefront of those emerging technologies from plant systems research and plant phenomics to irrigation technologies to precision agriculture, as well as having experience with developing and delivering technologies through innovative business plans and through innovative creative collaborations of the public sector with the private sector. So I'll start with a brief introduction of each of these in individuals. You have the full bios in your, in your um, materials, so I won't go into a lot of detail, but give you, try to give you a feel for uh, the diversity of perspectives that we have up here this morning, and then provide them some time to make comments, give some presentation if they like, and we'll come back to opening it up for discussion and questions from you, the audience. On my, on my immediate left is Daniel Schachman. Daniel joined the faculty uh, at UNL's Professor of Agronomy in 2014, and he quickly uh, also took on the role of director of the Biotechnology Center here at the University of Nebraska. In his most recent positions before coming to UNL, he was project lead and a science fellow at the Monsanto Company, and before that, a full member of the Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis. He's a plant molecular physiologist, and his research is centered on how roots respond and adapt to stressful conditions, including mechanisms, uh, mechanisms of salt tolerance in wheat. His current work focuses on the interaction between plant roots and soil microbes and the impacts, those inter the impacts of those interactions in holistic studies of plant performance. To his left is Art Ziegelbaum. Art joined the University of Nebraska in the late 90s as an administrative faculty member working in educational technology. And his research focuses on remote remotely sensed measurements of vegetation stress and photoprotective response. Before he came to UNL, Art spent nearly 30 years at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Progressing from an engineer working on spacecraft tracking systems to senior management. He's participated on the science teams of many space missions, including Voyager, Viking, and Helios, and helped test Einstein's theory of general relativity. I don't know whether he'll get into that today or not. You might want to follow up with him. In recent years here at UNL, Art has become an important contributor to team science across a range of research programs and projects, and most recently in our faculty-driven initiatives to expand plant phenomics, and that's uh, what he'll focus on today. Michael Dogert is Vice President of Sales and Marketing at CropEx, uh, a Tel Aviv-based irrigation technology company that also has offices in San Francisco and Denver. CropEx is a, an ag analytics company that develops cloud-based software solutions integrated with wireless sensors to help boost crop yields and save water and energy. And Michael's responsible for market-based product positioning, go-to market strategy, and sales objectives for the company. He's a 
former marketing director for Netafirm um, USA, uh, the largest drip irrigation company in the world, and he's also held positions in farm management, technical sales, and marketing for both startups and established companies. Uh, his academic training includes a doctorate in agronomy from Cornell University. And uh, at the end of the row is Scott Shearer. Scott is professor and chair in the Department of Food, Agriculture, and Biological Engineering at Ohio State University. And prior to that, he was a faculty member and chair uh, in biosystems and agricultural engineering at the University of Kentucky. His research efforts over his career focused on developing controls and methods for metering and, and spatial distribution of inputs for pre precision cropping systems. He currently has a range of research activities for modeling, from modeling current and future field machinery systems to development of precision agricultural tools. So just to give you a little bit of the idea or the logic for the order of the presentations, we're starting with some of the more uh, emerging basic sciences and platforms, um, have some comments around commercialization of technology and, and business plans, and then come back to Scott uh, around more field-based technologies and some of the collaborations uh, that will help deliver technology in that realm. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Daniel Schachman to start us off. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean Clutter, for inviting me to um, talk about the research that we're doing. Uh, the, the project that I'll talk mainly about is this uh, project entitled Enhancing Sustainable Biofuel Feedstocks Through Increased Nitrogen and Water Use Efficiency and in Interaction with the Soil Microbiome. Uh, there's a host of different <coughs> collaborators, both from UNL and from other places, and a lot of people in my lab that have helped with this. So um, what we're trying to do with this project is take you know, a systems approach, uh, and the system mainly encompasses both the plant and also the soil microbes. So this is relatively you know, different than many projects, but um, the idea is to use plant genetics to find the best, best varieties that have increased nitrogen and water use efficiency, and then also to study the microbes pretty intensively that uh, could impact um, increased drought tolerance and also um, nitrogen use efficiency. And so, I'll describe the project and then I'll focus more on the microbiome or the microbe side of things because um, that right now is an important emerging technology. So in this um, project, we'll be doing a lot of field surveys for uh, looking at the microbiome of energy sorghum and then also uh, looking at how plants survive under low nitrogen or, or grow under low nitrogen and low water and uh, we'll be also doing a lot of laboratory work, really trying to get at this interaction between the genotype of the plant, the genotype of the microbes, and then the environment. Um, there will also be controlled environment experiments. So we have a phenotyping facility at the Danforth Center that will be used to uh, phenotype and to test how you know, cocktails of microbes affect the nitrogen use and water use efficiency. And then in the fourth and fifth year, what we hope to do is bring some of the stuff back out to the, what we plan to do is to bring some of this stuff back out to the field and really test it. You know, can we introduce microbes to the soil to improve growth under uh, water limited and nitrogen limited conditions and then pick the best genotypes as well and test those. So it's a multidisciplinary group. Uh, there are 15 PIs, seven universities, one DOE institute. The project goes for um, five years. There'll be uh, four field sites chamber and field phenotyping. We'll be collecting about 16,000 samples over the five years for microbiome work. Um, we'll be sequencing 10,000 uh, bacterial genomes, and then uh, the project is roughly funded to about $14.5 million over this period. Um, so this is the team, and so I'm going to 
move around a little bit because I can't see the screen very well. So um, this is the team, and uh, so I'm the PI on the grant. Uh, I also have experience in abiotic stress physiology. We have a number of people involved in profiling, so we'll be doing transcriptional profiling and also um, metabolite profiling. We have four micro, microbe experts, two people who are expert in uh, the study of bacteria, one who's an expert in the study of mycorrhizal associations, and then Susanna Tringe is at um, the Joint Genome Institute. So that's where we'll be doing a lot of our sequencing and a lot of our analysis of uh, the microbiome. Uh, we have a couple of phenotyping experts, and you'll hear from one of them next, uh, Dr. Ziegelbaum, who is an expert in remote sensing and and phenomics, and, and you know, you've heard he's been involved with NASA with this project. We're trying to bring him down to Earth and uh, focus on you know the plants that are growing in the field. Um, we have a few data integration experts as well, and as well as people who are experts in genetics and genomics. So, um, why develop uh, energy sorghum for um, uh, bioenergy? Um, and, and so what we're aiming for is an ideotype where um, the, the crop or the plants will be uh, sustainable so we can grow them on marginal lands. And so the idea is that we'd like to try to move um, away from, you know, the, the corn belt and start using some of this marginal land to grow a highly productive um, biomass crop. Uh, so we need the plants to be nitrogen use efficient and also um, to be water use efficient. We'll be aiming for maximum and efficient carbon fixation, uh, high yields greater than 15 tons per acre, and then biotic and abiotic stress tolerance. And so that's kind of where we come in with the, this project with the abiotic stress tolerance. Uh, there's other features that the breeders are working on, high harvestability, so no lodging, high C6 to C5 carbon ratio, and th this is kind of tied into people um, in other parts of the Department of Energy that are working on um, uh, processes for s creating cellulosic ethanol. And one of the characteristics they want to see are this um, high C6 to C5 carbon ratio, also reduced lignin, minerals, and moisture content. Uh, so this just shows you the um, energy sorghum here. You can see there's a small person standing here. They're kind of interesting plants. They're sorghum bicolor, but they don't flower in North America. So they're uh, photoperiod sensitive, and so they just keep growing and growing and growing until the end of the season and don't flower. Uh, this is compared to sweet sorghum, which does flower in North America. You can see it's a little bit shorter, and then you can see kind of the dwarf grain sorghum that's really quite short. Okay, so the project objectives. For the microbiome part, uh, we want to describe who's there. Uh, this is kind of common in the field right now. There's a lot of descriptive work. We'll also be developing uh, sorghum root and leaf culture collections. So we want to have a very large collection of, of microbes by the end of this and also eventually determine the optimal microbial strains for sorghum normal under normal growth conditions and then stress conditions. And then we'll be looking at the... Um, the genetics of this as well. So we'll be doing the phenotypic characterizations, and that's what Dr. Ziegelbaum will talk about, to identify the lines that have the best water use and nitrogen use efficiency. And then once we find those, we'll either make crosses or some of these lines, we already have advanced populations, so it'll allow us to um, develop markers for breeders and actually map these traits. Uh, so. I've been in Nebraska for a couple of years, and it's been really a fabulous place to do this sort of research. The field facilities in um, Nebraska are just really unparalleled, lots of people to collaborate with. And this just shows you the, um, some, of, some of the major field facilities in Nebraska that UNL has. Um, we'll be working out at this Scotts Bluff research station. There's also uh, one in central western Nebraska in North Platte. Uh, we have a great facility here just north of Lincoln, and then there's another facility north of um, Omaha. And so one of the things we're capitalizing on for this uh, water use efficiency research is this uh, climactic um, uh, diversity in Nebraska. So there's diversity not only in rainfall and soil fertility, um, 
And uh, what you see is that it's pretty wet in the eastern part of the state and very dry in the western part of the state. And so we'll have two sites here in Scotts Bluff and in Sydney, which are you know, probably closer to Den much closer to Denver than they are to um, Omaha or Lincoln. And there we'll be doing um, some of this drought testing uh, where we'll be uh, working in dry land situations. So now I'm going to kind of focus more on the microbiome work because I think this is an, um, an important uh, emerging technology. So, you know, why the microbiome now? Uh, there have been microbes that have been used in agriculture for a long time, but um, there's still a lot of untapped potential of the um, diverse metabolic functions of microbes. So I think we've only kind of touched the tip of the iceberg with understanding you know, what's out there and what they can do for agriculture. Um, there's also a limited knowledge of the um, microbes that inhabit roots or endophytes. So we know a lot about mycorrhizal fungi. We also know a lot about rhizobium. But there's a lot of other microbes, uh, bacteria and fungi, that actually live inside plant roots. We really don't know what they're doing um, or, um, you know, how to manipulate them. Uh, and then the third reason why the um, microbiome, it's a good time to study this now, is that there's some new methods available. So in the past 10 years, there's these next-gen sequencing methods that allow us to actually, um, what you can do is you can extract DNA from soils, um, and you can look at the whole population of microbes in those soils. So that's kind of an un, un, um, culture-free approach to knowing who's there. Uh, in the past, you know, maybe 10 years ago, so, so this culture-free approach started about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, mainly with the, studying the gut microbiome, and now we're starting to use it uh, to study plants and, um, and roots. So um, the importance of this area is also highlighted by a lot of um, private sector investment. Uh, so I made this slide about a year ago and then updated it for this talk, and there's probably like three or four more um, startup companies in the ag space that are uh, involved in microbiome research. Uh, you've seen a lot of mergers and acquisitions from the big multinational uh, companies. So um, Becker Underwood was purchased by BASF a few years ago. AgriQuest, a small um, Davis company, Davis California company was purchased by Bayer uh, for a huge amount of money. Um, Agratis was purchased by Monsanto, and then Monsanto created what they call the BioAg Alliance with Novozymes, and that supposedly is about a $300 million project um, where they'll be working to distribute what Novozymes already has in the way of microbials and also discover new ones. So um, I think it really started um, mainly to come to the forefront of people's attention with all this gut microbiome work. And so um, the gut microbiome work's been largely descriptive and correlative, but it's been moving in the direction to really understand function. And there's some interesting papers out there on obesity, immunology, um, metab metabolic functions, and also you know, linking neurological function to your gut and the microbes in your gut. Um, really, there haven't been a lot of treatments that have come out yet, except for the um, fecal transplants that have a very high degree of success in curing um, C. diff uh, infection. And so, you know, in the past, people have used um, antibiotics. It's kind of hit and miss. But um, if you transplant someone's, um, a healthy person's um, uh, microbiome from their gut into a sick person's, there's something like a 90% chance that they'll recover. So it's, it's really spectacular, a lot of research, and people are figuring out how to use this technology safely now. <clears throat> so in terms of plants um, and in terms of drought tolerance, you know, I went out and I looked for some um, uh, information that these small companies have. And so one of them is called um, Adaptive Symbiotic Technologies. They claim that they have a cocktail of fungi that will increase the drought resistance of plants. And so uh, I spent five years in industry, so I'm kind of used to some of these claims that you hear. And so uh, one claim that they have is that it um, increases yield by 25 to 85%. That's 
You know, if, if that was real, that would be unbelievable. Um, and then they come down and they say a 7% overall yield increase over two years. So I'm not sure how they go from 25 to 85% to 7%. Uh, so I'm a little bit skeptical, but um, you know, they have a lot of, they have some data. Here is a chart if you go to their website. You can see that in this very dry year in 2012, we had a pretty severe drought throughout the United States that they showed an 85% increase in, in yields uh, when they were growing the, the uh, testing this microbe in, um, in Michigan. So there's another company that has really pretty exciting claims. Uh, Indigo is researching micros so that we can feed the next billion people. And this could come true. Um, but their data is you know, a little bit thin right now. So they show a lead microbe from their collection confers drought tolerance uh, to soy, leading to yield increases. And what they're showing in these pictures is basically you know, a, a, a potted plants in pots without microbes and with microbes and with microbes. The plants survive for longer under the drought condition. So, um, what I'm saying, and I, and I may not be completely on track with this because it's hard to tell exactly what industry is doing because they don't give all the information out, but it seems like most of the companies are prospecting for microbes, so they're building these large collections, and then they're taking the, whatever they can a culture into the greenhouse or into the field and screening them. So in the case of Monsanto and Novozymes, they are screening you know, over 300 a, microbes a year in the field. Um, and then a lot of companies like Indigo are sequencing microbial genomes. Um, and they're creating this collection. So all I can surmise from that is that with genome data that they might be able to make some inferences as to the function of the microbes to get an idea of what might be their best targets. Uh, so what we're doing is a little bit different. So, you know, in, in academia, I don't have to create a product immediately. And so basically what we're doing is working on gaining knowledge through culture-free analysis of, the, um, of, of microbes using a tool, uh, a 16S ribosomal gene. And the idea here is to develop hypotheses based on this culture-free analysis and then to go back into a culture collection and screen microbes. So that's one thing we're doing. And then another thing we'd like to do that I think is really important is to really understand the relationship between root exudates and microbes. So I think this is going to be one of the keys to engineering these relationships, is if we can figure out what sort of chemicals a root would exude that would favor the uh, growth of a particular microbe, uh, that would kind of make this relationship stronger and we could um, implement it on a larger scale. So um, I'll just base, I have a few data slides. Uh, so I wanted to introduce this culture-free approach to um, identifying who's in the sample. Essentially, what we do is we do um, polymerase chain reaction on this 16S small subunit of ribosomal RNA genes. And so what we do is the um, 16S has this region here. It's called the V4 region. Um, these, these yellow regions in general are uh, rapidly evolving. And so, um, and these regions, these dark regions here are very conserved. So you can design primers for people that are familiar with molecular work and you can amplify up this V4 region. And essentially the V4 region allows you to assign um, a genus or a species level to a particular piece of DNA that you're analyzing. Um, the 16S is present in all bacteria and archaea. And so this is the tool we use for this culture-free analysis. Uh, the field work is pretty simple. We go out with uh, buckets and shovels and a team of people and we dig up roots. And so these are kind of our tools. We go out and we, um, with, with tubes filled with a phosphate buffer, we shake the roots to get the rhizosphere soil off. Um, and then we take the roots and then bring them back into the lab and surface sterilize them. And that is our, you know, what microbes, th that allows us to figure out what microbes are inside the root. And then we know what's in, in the rhizosphere, that region just outside the root. And then we also take a bulk soil sample. And so this is an example of some interesting data that we have from the rhizosphere from last summer. 
This is actually on this energy sorghum project. And so um, kind of a common way that people use to represent this data are these uh, PCOA plots. And what you can see here is, um, so this is uh, July and September. And what you can see, it's hard to see in this picture, but maybe a little bit easier on this, these screens here. But uh, you can see there's like a green blob of samples kind of sitting out there. Um, some green and white that are mixed together here and some green and white here. And um, basically these are the root samples from two different times, from July and September. They group together and then the September rhizosphere groups together with the July and September soil. Uh, and then there's this kind of outlier group, which is, we found very interesting. So usually the rhizosphere microbial populations is very similar to what's in the soil, but in this case, at this time of the year, you can see that there is something unique about this, this um, group of microbes in July. And another way to represent it is using these heat, heat, um, heat maps. And so essentially what I'm showing here is these are the July samples, and then these are the uh, September samples. And you can see this, the reason why the rhizosphere kind of lays out on its own. And that's because there's um, a lot of these pseudomonads and sphingobacteriaceae that are, you know, uh, blooming, we think, at that time. And so, so then with this data, what we hope to do is to begin to test hypotheses. You know, are these specific microbes important early on? in um, plant growth and development. Um, and so this is just an example of how we would like to use some of this culture-free data to really decide what microbes we want to then um, test in the greenhouse or in the growth chamber. And uh, this kind of will give us a handle. So it's a little bit more hypothesis driven than just trying any old microbe. Um, so so uh, Dean Clutter asked people to you know, talk about what are the critical, I think we'll discuss this more, but what are the critical technological problems or challenges um, that this technology faces? And so I think there's two major ones that I think about. One is how do we efficiently find the best microbes for uh, enhancing growth and development? That's a real tough one, because there's so many microbes out there in the soil. How do you figure out which ones are gonna be good and then the other really difficult thing will be to engineer stable relationships with these microbes. So we might find a microbe that works really well in the greenhouse. It uh, increases plant growth. It, it, it enhances drought tolerance or nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, but when you go out to the field um, and you introduce that microbe into the soil, you're introducing it into this very complex ecosystem. And so the chances of, a, of, of this microbe being able to you know, colonize the roots and compete with the other microbes is, is you know, I think it's fairly small. Um, and this is a problem that people have noted for years. So um, again, Dean Clutter asked about uh, us to talk about scaling of this technology. And uh, I'm not exactly sure you know, where we're going to go with this, but I can see that uh, with, as with rhizobium, if we can get these microbes out to a more centralized location where seeds can be treated with these microbes and then farmers could plant them, that you could actually scale up this technology. I think one of the barriers to scaling it up is that it's, it's a live material. Um, it may have a short shelf life. And so we need to come up with you know, uh, the best formulations to apply to seeds. Uh, but since it's part of a seed, it should be fairly easy to get out to farmers. Um, and so I think we'll ad address these questions uh, as the time goes on, these last two questions. And so I'll just wrap it up there and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Tina. I think we'll just uh, move down the line here and then we can open it up for questions. So Art, welcome to the podium. Thank you. Do I press the button? I think someone will be assisting you with slides. Okay. There we go. Well, first of all, I, th I thank uh, the dean for the very nice introduction. I also want to thank him. He, he, he wasn't well introduced, but he's done a very nice job creating a, a very productive and good research environment. And we're all grateful for that. And 
my PI, uh, Daniel Schachman, for creating an incredible learning envir environment for me. There's uh, a lot of terms and new things that I'm, that I'm learning. And that's probably the, the neatest part of uh, my careers is that I've gotten to work with people that I learn from. And this is certainly a case. So the title that Daniel suggested was Emerging Technologies and Plant Phenomics Across Multiple Scales Providing Linkages. I won't, I'll stop there. And, and to me, this is part of my new thing as a scientist. Scientists tend to classify things in gazillions of ways. And, and that title is an example of it. Of course, being an ex-engineer, this does go forward. There we go. Uh, my title is pheno Phenotyping and Remote Sensing. What are the chances? And of course, that's because engineers are very simple people. Now, we classify the world in exactly two things. Those things that are broken that need fixing and those things that work just fine that need fixing. So, <laughs> but let me talk about that. And, and we talk about challenges of scale. We talk about the difference between what we measure in the greenhouse and, and what the impact will be on what we measure in the field because it, these plants are very different. Now, it, as, as Dean Clutter mentioned, I was very involved in the space program. I am, in fact, a rocket, was, in fact, a rocket scientist. And I've got to tell you, this stuff is complicated. So I'm going to do an overview of, of remote sensing. I assume very little knowledge on your part, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the background. This is very much an emerging field, has been for many years. There's much research, incredible amount of hope, and there is some overpromise, as you might have noticed. So first of all, what is phenotyping? Phenotyping is basically looking at those things on the plant that you can measure. It can be the size of leaves, the morphology, its phenological state, its behavior. And you can talk about lots of things that you want to measure to learn about impacts. For example, how drought tolerant is it? Does it stay green? How, how well is it uh, regulating the compounds? How about water use efficiency? Um, how does this nitrogen efficiency change under stress? nitrogen drought impacts on the various characteristics of the plant, and, and of course the impact of soils. So let me talk about remote sensing for just a minute. Probably many of you know this, but for those of you that don't, I'll go through it fairly quickly. When light hits a leaf, it does four things. It can be reflected as energy. It can be absorbed in the plant, do photosynthesis for all the things that keep all of us alive. It can be transmitted through the plant, and it can be fluoresced after it's been absorbed into molecules on the plant. If maize had no, no, if corn had no water and no pigments, its, its spectrum would look like this. This is basically the bones of the plant, the lignans, the uh, cellular structure. And we talk about three regions of the, the spectrum, the PAR, photosynthetically active region, or visible light, near infrared and either the short wave infrared or middle infrared. And the characteristics are that in the visible light, there are pigments that absorb light and there's light scattering. In the near infrared, there's very little, very few absorbers. So it's mainly light scattering. Near infrared is a good place to measure how much material you're looking at. And then the middle infrared, that's structural light scatter and absorption primarily by water, but also other molecules, sucrose, for example. Now let me add water to this spectrum. So um, you'll notice there's four predominant lines, and as I add more water, you see more absorption. These are the various oscillation mechanisms within the water molecule that absorb light. If I add pigments now, you'll notice a very profound absorption in the visible light. Matter of fact, it's pretty amazing that when you see a green plant, you're seeing about five to seven percent of reflected light. The rest is absorbed or transmitted through, although most of it is absorbed. You measure these spectra with uh, instruments like this, spectroradiometers. These are non-imaging instruments. They measure just the spectrum within a field of view, as I'll show you in some of the platforms. Basically, we look at an area, say, two and a half meters in diameter, and integrate all the light from that area into the spectrum. Some examples of the in instruments, ASD, or as is now called Pan Analytics, it has a full range instrument, 350 to 2,500 nanometers, so covering the visible through the middle infrared. That's about $75,000, not cheap, because the sensors out at the middle infrared have to be cooled. They're uh, expensive and they need to be thermally actively cooled. An ocean optics instrument, which is fairly small, is only around $5,000, and that's visible in near infrared. So what kind of platforms do we have? Well. We have leaf level. So here's an instrument, and you can see that uh, 
There must be, oh, here it is. You'll notice there are two wires. This one is power for the lamp, and this one is an optical fiber that takes the light back to the spectrometer. Here we are at canopy level with uh, fiber looking down, an upwelling fiber it's called to look at the plant, and it's also measuring the downwelling light from the sky. So you can take the ratio and get the reflectance. And this is a wireless system that we use, a computer. As a matter of fact, the funny thing here is this is out at the field at, at Sydney where I'm sitting in the middle of the field in a chair with a laptop and uh, the graduate students walking around taking data. It was a very rough duty. My favorite platform is this one. This is Hercules. Hercules is a donated Hage sprayer. It can hold instruments about uh, 20 feet or so above the canopy. And for a city boy like me, it's a marvelous way to do science and play with a big toy. We also have an uh, aircraft that has a hyperspectral imager that can be used for taking data and making measurements, and we're actively using it on, on, on our projects. So what good are these spectra? Well, let's look at some of the, some of the characteristics. And, and these are based on models or indices. Probably you've all heard of NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. It's basically two wavelengths. You take the difference and, and um, divide it by the sum of the reflectance of those points to normalize it, and it gives an indication of greenness, or how much vegetation there is. But you'll notice a problem. It's nonlinear. So as a matter of fact, when you get to any significant amounts of chlorophyll, uh, you don't see changes very, very well as, uh, as the plants continue to mature. One example of the work that goes on at the Center for Advanced Land Management Information Technologies and the School of Natural Resources is some work by Anatoly Gittelson where he developed a new index, the Red Edge Chlorophyll Index, and you'll notice it's very linear. So it, it maintains its sensitivity um, at, no matter the amount of, of chlorophyll. So this technique can be used to estimate gross primary production by looking at the amount of chlorophyll over time. This has been tested locally, regionally, and globally, literally. Uh, or Russia, uh, Israel, um, all over. And it ends up, it's insensitive to the type of plant. And um, so it's a universal kind of measuring tool. Um, you can estimate nitrogen because nitrogen is very tied to chlorophyll. And of course, example here of chlorophyll versus this index, uh, very, very good estimator. There we go. So, Anatoly Gittleson and his colleagues came up with this, a simple equation which works under several circumstances, basically the, inverse, the uh, difference of the inverse of uh, the reflectance of two wavelengths times a third wavelength. The chlorophyll red edge index is an example where lambda 2 and lambda 3 are the same. So a very simple index uses two, two spectral lines, one of which is sensitive out here to the amount of material and the other one is sensitive to the amount of chlorophyll and you get these neat graphs, as I showed you earlier. Anatoly spent his time here. Um, he's now retired in Israel, back in Israel. But he's discovered sensitivities of, the various, of various wavelengths to various pigments, run, pigments running from carotenoids, anthocyanin, and, and chlorophyll, and developed a, identified the wavelengths that worked very well, so that, in fact, you can estimate the amount of chlorophyll or anthocyanin, carotenoids in the leaf. And there are many indices. There's a gazillion index. As a matter of fact, there's an index out there which if you look for it, it's called the Ziegelbaum Water Stress Index and it's a pile of crap. But other than that, it was picked up and published out of a paper that I had. It doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work was an area that interested me, which is my specialty, which is looking at photoprotective effects. A lot of the problems in remote sensing is that, that there's a separation between engineering and science. Engineers build these wonderful tools and scientists know these wonderful things, and the two don't always mix. I discovered that there was an error, that you had an error existing in, in making measurements at different times of day. As a matter of fact, I saw a significant change in the amount of chlorophyll in plants between morning and afternoon. But if you take a chemical extraction of those plants, you discover the chlorophyll didn't change. But observations with indices like this showed a change. And it's called chloroplast avoidance movement, which some of you may be familiar with, and I won't give you that lecture. But chloroplast avoidance movement has been known since 1849, and it's been published and shown. I can show you the impact in papers running for the last three decades, and nobody's recognized it. It's a noise source for making these kinds of measurements. So that's my particular specialty. But now I'm getting into phenomics, which is a, turns out is really interesting. And under phenomics, 
you can measure things. I mentioned the pigments before, also leaf water content. It looks like you can measure sugar content, concentration of lignans, cellulose, other molecules. And I want to talk about a photosynthetic activity in just a minute. You'll notice that in this, in this chart, you can see what part of the spectrum has sensitivities to different kinds of compounds and materials. Now, when I say indicates here, the reason I say indication is uh, either by using principal component analysis or partial least square regression, you can come up and show there's a relationship. But the thing that has not come out yet is how do I use that relationship in a setting other than the, than the materials that the people tested with, coming up with a generalized index that works for these things in other settings. That's something we're going to be working on. So I showed you how to do a single spectrum and, and where I integrate the light from, a, from a, a large area. But what if I were to take an image at each wavelength? So I end up with a hypercube, an image at each wavelength. So now I've got a, a, a cube that I can look at and study at any pixel. Get, I'm sorry, get the, retrieve the spectrum for any point. So I can look at plants in very interesting ways. I can combine these images mathematically with these indices. And here's an example. Here's an NDVI image where the brighter it is, the greener it is within this leaf. Uh, by setting the minimal value of NDVI, I can define the leaves, use that to help um, uh, retrieve this other index. Um, basically, I'm adding these two together so I get an image of this PRI with, uh, within the leaves. PRI is an indicator of, of uh, xanthophyll, xanthophyll cycle status. So you notice here this leaf has been cut. These red indicate that there's a photoprotective response, and as the leaf dies, that goes away. So taking pictures with your camera is basically very easy. You have a two-dimensional sensor, x-axis on one, y on the other, you get a picture. Yeah, there are different wavelengths, basically red, green, blue, and you can either take, have your sensor divided up red, green, blue, or you can have three or four different sensors fairly easy. The problem comes about when you want a thousand or two thousand colors. So for the so-called hyperspectral. And the way that's done is by using that sensor in a slightly different way. The x-axis is the real x-axis for your picture. The y-axis becomes the spectrum for each point. And then you need to scan this thing along the y-axis to develop a picture. And you can see the example of the, the hypercube. Now, these instruments are not cheap. Here's a panning one with a limited bandwidth for about $35,000 and the head wall, similar to what we have in the Lemnitech facility here, costs about $120,000. They have, in the case of this cheaper one, they have basically a, tan, a panning uh, motor that allows it to scan. In the case of the, the head wall, there's a mirror that scans. There's another option, which is cheaper instruments, multi-spectral imagers. These are intended for drones. They're lightweight, low power, relatively low resolution, and they are fairly cheap, $5,000 to $20,000. Now, I want to mention very quickly solar-induced fluorescence, which is the new hot thing. If you look at, when, when a plant is photosynthesizing, it fluoresces. And you can see an example of the fluorescence here in this upper left. And if you look at this reflective spectrum, you can see a little bump right there, for example, at around uh, uh, 730 nanometers. And, and that's due to, or 760 nanometers, and that's that fluorescent signature. The problem, though, is how do you see that signature in a plant under bright sunlight? It's hard to see. Well, the clue comes here. This is the solar spectrum. The yellow is the top of the atmosphere. The red is bottom of the atmosphere. And you'll notice these dips. These are Fraunhofer lines. They're lines where uh, molecules in the atmosphere absorb a lot of light. Matter of fact, there's an O2, an oxygen feature, that absorbs about 90% of the light near this fluorescent signature. So you, in effect, add the fluorescence to the reflected light. And you notice here there's a dip. There's a difference in depth. A lot of algorithms are coming out to identify the depth of that, the, the change here, so you know how much fluorescence there is in the plant. Now, this is uh, uh, good for, uh, reported to be good for understanding the photosynthetic activity. A non-imaging spectrometer with a good enough resolution to measure this is around 6,000. You can get an imager from head to wall for 160,000, but then you can do neat things like this. This is a corn plant 
through the day, starting about 10.30, and I can't quite read the end there, but you can see the center of photosynthetic activity here, very red. So you can watch how photosynthesis, photosynthetic activity changes in the plant throughout the day. There are other sensors, infrared thermal imagers that are good for retrieving ET, for example. You plain old RGB and your infrared cameras cost about $100. You can measure plant structure. You can also uh, look at color and also approximate chlorophyll content or NDVI. I would be wrong if I didn't mention drones, which are the newest platform. Drones can either come in fixed wing or uh, these uh, rotorcraft. They put uh, uh, multi-spectral imagers on them. You can get some neat things like this. These pictures here showing no nitrogen stress, lots of nitrogen stress. Now, drone applications offer inexpensive, frequent field scale observations. You can fly these daily or, multiply, or multiple times a day. They um, observe changes over time or plant differences in the field so the farmer can tell this is a good area, this is a bad area, I might have to put nitrogen over here. Um, come on, there we go. Its current use is largely the RGB near infrared cameras. This thing, oh, that works. Uh, NDVI multispectral cameras are used. The challenges, though, are the duration is limited by the amount of battery you can carry on it. The stability, as these things are flying along, they're, they're hit by the wind, they move around, so you have to recover from, from that instability. Uh, weight and power limits for instruments, and there are government flight restrictions, which hopefully are getting simplified. There's great promise, and uh, there's a strong demand for, for more science to identify more ways to use the data from drones. We, for example, have a MOU with a, one of the major UAV manufacturers to help identify things that can be done and to test uh, things that they are trying. The challenge in what we are doing, first of all, we're trying to develop a scientific basis for understanding the spectral signatures resulting from changes in biophysical parameters, osmoregulated compounds, stress, and so on. Um, one of the things that I, I was going to mention when I showed you the leaf level through Hercules in the aircraft, we very much use a bootstrap technique. When you're in the lab, you have very strong signals, and you don't have a lot of confounding signals. So you learn what you can about the spectral signature. Then you move to the field, then you measure at the canopy level, the aircraft, and then up at the space-based instruments. So it's a, very much a bootstrap process. We've done that classically. We now recognize the need to do a similar thing, especially for imaging in these uh, longer wavelengths. So we're going to create a spectral phenotyping research laboratory, and before the dean gets upset, I'm not asking for space and I'm not asking for funding yet. Um, but we're going to measure spectra in a controlled, strong signal laboratory environment, image and non-image, um, create spectral models, indices, as you saw that we did for uh, the pigments, uh, test and validate that using full uh, field platforms, uh, Hercules and another platform we have, Goliath, full, full range spectrometers, and specify the wavelengths. If we can identify good wavelengths for multispectral instruments, then we can make relatively cheap imaging instruments for the field to use. And we're going to explore, explore drones for research and applications. It's clear when, when the duration goes up and the stability gets better and the knowledge of position and attitude get better, these will be the way to do this kind of research and ultimately um, uh, applications. So, doing hyperspectral, you know, you can observe a lot by just watching, as uh, Yogi Berra said. And we are, of course, very grateful to our funding agencies for making this all possible. Thanks, sorry. Michael, the, the floor is yours. Thanks. Okay, so I'm here. Uh, by the way, I have no slides. One of my biggest challenges, of course, is to not make this a sales talk. I'm in a commercial business, and I'm not really trying to sell you guys anything. And but so I, I just, I'm just going to speak to you about CropX, what we do, and try to relate it to how do you commercialize these technologies. And I don't have, you know, a lot of detail, but I have some detail on how you commercialize. And then, you know, what are the public-private partnership, which is kind of the 
overall uh, goal of this. I actually really want to thank Arthur for bringing me back to my grad level uh, plan phys class, and I really am tremendously thankful there's no test because I didn't really do very well on spectrums and photosynthesis. It wasn't my specialty. Uh, so anyway, CropX. CropX is a startup. We've actually been commercial for two years, although we've existed for five years under a couple of different names. Uh, we're involved in combining uh, hardware and software in an easy to use uh, system to measure soil moisture. We can then use that data actually to, to uh, we actually create prescriptions to start with and we can apply those prescriptions to a pivot to do variable rate irrigation and, and so you're kind of precision ag. And, and so we basically right now have two products. One is just simple soil moisture sensing. One is actually a variable rate control system. And it's with cloud connect connected pivots. We don't actually do the cloud connection or the pivot control. We just feed the prescription in. Uh, so how did it start? I think it's actually really relevant how it started because it actually applies to the public uh, private partnership. Uh, we, we, some work done at the Land Care Research Institute, which is a public institution in New Zealand, and they were actually looking at, at uh, EM maps and how do EM maps in the field actually relate to differences in the water release curves of the soil. And they found that EM maps alone actually don't relate very well to the water release curves in the soil. And that topography is actually a really critical issue. And that you have to actually combine an EM map or a soil map with topography to actually get a really good prescription for your field. This was really, you know, kind of their key. And this is what first interested the principles of crop acts was this kind of uh, uh, additional factor that needed to be considered. Uh, the, second, the second thing they found is actually these prescriptions aren't constant over the, over the course of the year. As the plant grows, the prescription changes. You know, you might have a slightly wet area early in the year that produces a more vigorous crop. That more vigorous crop uses more water. All of a sudden, in the end of the year, you have a dry area, not a wet area. So they decided that you needed, you can't, having simply a prescription isn't really good enough. You need to have soil moisture sensors to kind of see what's going on in these key areas. Okay. Um, this is where actually I came into CropEx. They come to me and they say, okay, how do we commercialize this? I actually happened to be out of work at the time. I was really happy to take a job and say, okay, how do we commercialize this? And so we looked at and, and this actually applies to everything you guys are, is how do we, how do you commercialize this? And so for that, you have to look at okay, what's going on with the sensor industry that already exists in the United States? How do you, you know, what's, what's going on with that industry? And of course, we've heard if people listen this morning, you know, only 10 to 15% of farmers actually use sensors to make irrigation decisions. So the, the first big question is why, you know, why aren't people putting in more sensors, okay? Uh, and there's, there's, there's several reasons, and actually there's probably many more than I outlined, but again, I try to focus on what I consider main reasons. And, and you know, one is price. The sensors are very, are quite expensive. And if you look at, you know, okay, if you're a grape farmer in California, it's not a real problem. If you're a corn farmer, you know, particularly at 370 corn, it's, it's actually a, a, you know, pretty big expense. Uh, the second thing is they're very complex. People have to put them in, they have to take them out. You know, it's not so much that the data is complex, but actually getting a sensor to work, you know, the right way is, is complex. And, and the second thing is, is what also is complex is how do you connect it to the internet? You know, you need a data plan, you might need a solar panel, you need data modems or radios, and that adds a level of complexity to the system. So we have, you know, a, 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 basically we have an expensive system that's relatively complex. These were the primary areas that we decided to work on. So uh, to start with, our, our goal was to create a, a do-it-yourself system. 
something that someone can actually, you know, can, can go online and actually set up themselves. We go back to the original work, which is that we need soil maps and we need topography. And, and so we tried to figure out, okay, so how are we going to do this? So the system that we came up with, and I'm not saying there's a perfect system, the system that we came up with is, okay, we said we have USDA maps for the country. Actually, most people say they're not very good, but I'm actually on the other side. They actually are pretty good, surprisingly. Not for 100% of the area, but again, you know, you don't have to cover 100%. You know, if, you know, if only 10% of farmers are using it, if, you, if it's good 50% of the time, it's good. So we start with a USDA map. Actually, I'll just go through the process because it's pretty easy to, to describe. You know, people would go online to the website, you decide to register. You get a Google map on your screen, you click on that map, you, you put in your zip code, it takes you to near where you live, you find a field, let's say you have a pivot, you click on the pivot, it outlines the pivot, if it doesn't outline, you draw a circle, and you click, you click on the circle, and actually the software actually pulls up a USDA map, pulls up, uses Google Earth to pull up a topography map. It actually uses Google Earth to figure solar angle. By the way, when topography is important, solar angle is important. If you're on the north side of a hill, it's going to be wetter than the south side. And within a minute, online, while you're watching it, it actually creates a, a, uh, a prescription of your field. Uh, if you have an EM map and you want more detail, you can upload an EM map. You know, we, we're not saying you don't do this, but we're trying to give those 90% of farmers a tool that they can start with without spending, you know, a couple thousand dollars. They can just go and get this to start with. The map also shows how many sensors you need. Generally, it's two or three, and where the, those sensors should be located. You then go to and purchase sensors if you want to purchase sensors, or you can just, you know, exit. Uh, but you can, you can just purchase sensors, and sensors come in the mail. Uh, you download a phone app onto a smartphone, and it actually gives you a Google directions to where those sensors should be. And you walk out into the field, and you go to a general area of where those sensors should be. And I'll talk a little bit about the sensor, so I'm just talking about the process. The, you go to where the sensors should be, you, you, and you don't have to pick the exact area, you know, you have within a 20 or 40 foot, because obviously you don't want to put it in a drive row or right under a sprinkler, you know, you decide where you want to, where is the best place to put it, and, and you install the sensor, again, I'll explain, it's, it's, it's very simple. There's a little magnetic switch, you remove the magnet to turn it on, there's a QR code, the app allows you to click on the QR code, and then we use the GPS and the phone to fix the location. And within two minutes, you're actually reading soil moisture. Uh, I, one thing I did skip is before you uh, install, you, you kind of drill a pilot hole, which is like a half-inch hole, and you pour a half gallon of water in that hole, which saturates that soil, and that starts your calibration process. So it's that simple. Um, so I'll talk a little, and, and essentially you're getting data. So a lot of this is for two reasons, how can we do this? One is because we actually use, you know, cloud-based computing for calibration curves, for actually we use machine learning to improve the calibration curves, and, and everything is done, basically everything is done in the cloud. And, and this is where the sensor is actually kind of cool. So we're not using any magic sensor. We haven't developed any. We're using a capacitance sensor, sensor that's been around for 30 years. It has limitations. We understand high salts, not going to work. Maybe, maybe some heavy clay soils, it's not going to work. But we've made that sensor better because we actually uh, can calibrate it in because because first of all, we start with soil, we know what, what soil is going into, so we know what the water, we have an idea of what that water release curve is, okay? So we're starting with a known point, but we can actually adjust that curve as that sensor wets and dries, we can actually fine tune the calibration of that curve. So we, while 
capacitance sensors aren't perfect sensors, we get the maximum out of that sensor. That's, that's really what we do. And in our view, the key is that we're trying to provide a tool for the farmer, an inexpensive tool that any farmer can use and, and, and it can give him, at least to start measuring. Let's just start with the measuring side. We'll talk a little bit about the variable rate irrigation side. So one of the cool, some of the cool things on the sensor is, is we actually put the capacitance probe, we built a little spiral auger and the probe is actually on the wings of the auger, so you drill this thing in, and the auger drills it into the ground. You can actually use like a, a little uh, battery drill and just drill it into the ground. And those wings are actually going into relatively undisturbed soil. So you have a minimal disturbance of the soil. Okay, it's not undisturbed, but it's minimally disturbed. You're not digging out a hole, putting in a sensor, throwing slurry in it. You actually have a relatively undisturbed soil. Uh, we're only, we're really focused on, on the main root zone. Now we can put sensors at any depth, but our, our primary sensor is at 8 inches and 18 inches. Because right now we're focused on the root zone. Can, we can have a sensor, put it down 40 inches if people want to look for if water's going below. But for a farmer who's managing his crop, the focus is in the 8 weeks or 10 weeks he's irrigated, is he managing his root zone correctly? This is our focus. I'm not saying it's the right focus, but right now this is our focus, is how to get the farmer to manage his crop better. And actually through our, the farmers who used it last year, even farmers who you know, use things like CanSCED or the ET scheduler were actually surprised at how often they over and under watered. They're actually pretty surprised. So it shows that having more data points. Okay, we're a big fan of more data points. People talk about big data. I'm a guy who says there's not enough data out there. Everybody's taking the same data, weather data, this and that, and they're slicing it up a hundred different ways. We need more data points. So our goal is to get more, more data points out there. Other cool things about the sensor is uh, we've stripped all the electronics out of the sensor. So, you know, most sensor, most capacitance sensors have a, a curve built into it. They have a set of electronics. That's all done in the cloud. All we're doing is sending a uh, 100 megahertz pulse. We read it and send that raw data to the cloud and it's all manipulated there. So we save on this, on this, on, on, on this electronics. And to me, the coolest thing, which, you know, I, I, I didn't, the technicians came up with, we actually transmit all our data via SMS, text message. So, you know, essentially you have a number, you're going to send a number. So we actually send everything like as a number. Okay, why is that so cool? Number one, SMS works where almost no other cellular works, okay? You can send a text message where you can't talk on your phone. So it gives us the broadest coverage. The other thing is SMS is very inexpensive. You know, if you want to buy a data plan or anything like that, it's very expensive. So this is, it's very inexpensive. And, and uh, you know, frankly, when you're talking about soil moisture, we measure it every 20 minutes and, you know, find that, you know, I, I would say that, you know, in a lot of cases, that's probably more than you need. I mean, soil doesn't change. One of the things that new farmers learn that they were very surprised, like, how fast does water move in the soil? Okay, it moves at different rates, but, you know, an average of one inch an hour isn't that unusual. And so we would have guys who would get a rainfall and say, hey, your sensor's not showing us the rainfall. And we're like, yeah, well, you're 18 inches deep and you got a rainfall 12 hours ago. Your water hasn't reached your sensor yet, in fact. You can see it on the 8 inch. You can't see it on the deeper one. And they're like, oh, that means the plant took it out. And say, no, you have to, you know, water has to move. And so it's actually creating a certain level of understanding of what's going on. So it's, you know, this is the, you know, so this is the basic process and the, the basic idea and what we think about when we talk about taking technology and commercializing, you know, technology. So if, if we talk about public, I, I will say just, and, you know, just to give an idea is that a sensor costs about less than $400 
and there's a subscription price that actually includes your cellular and everything. So the farmer doesn't buy cellular, doesn't buy anything. He just buys the sensor, puts it in, it works. So it's a very relatively easy, you know, relatively low price system compared to what, what is out there. Uh, so you talk about public-private partnerships. Actually, we were born of research like you guys did. We took basic research, and by the way, I, I'm not showing you all the algorithms and all the data, but there was a huge amount of data that was done at the Landcare Institute to develop algorithms which how do you combine soil maps with topography maps with solar aspect, and how do you create an irrigation, how do you create prescription from that. They did a tremendous amount of basic research and, in, and, and they're continuing to do that research for us. So we continue to actually partner with them to continue to improve those algorithms so that we get better. And as we get more data, they'll actually be able to create better models. The other thing, and it's not really, I don't like partnership because I think there's, there's public-private interaction. Some of it is partnership, but there's like interaction. So the USDA maps, which I think, you know, are, like I said, I actually get more government guys, more NRCS guys saying, you know, those maps aren't very good. You know, and, and you know, I have to say it's pretty funny because I'm not saying they're perfect and actually there are places where they're a lot better than others, but it's pretty interesting because when I've had more than, more than half the farmers, when we show them the prescription that we've come out with, which basically has a wet zone, a dry zone, and an average zone, you know, they're like, I would have drawn that exactly myself. That's exactly what I think my field looks like. By the way, we believe farmers know their fields. And, and most of them know it. They just don't know. It's not that they don't know their field. They, they, they don't have any easy way to deal with with the variability in their field. And the goal for, to me, the goal for this kind of public-private is how do we give them easy ways to deal with this, cost-effective ways. And this is my last point. I don't think I even use that, you know, half of my time, but that's okay because, uh, so I think, I think, and you've heard this a lot, but this is a big, you know, for me, this is, this is usually important. Farming is a business, okay? Farmers, it's a complex business. It's not necessarily a high profit business. It's a business. These guys are businessmen, okay? When you say something's gonna cost $4 an acre or $3 an acre or a few thousand dollars, you know, that's real money to a farmer, okay? And he looks at that, how that affects his bottom line and how that can possibly affect his top line, okay? Now farmers, they've also, frankly, actually, farmers have been in business Many farms have been in business more than 100 years. I mean, how many businesses do you know who've been in business that long? I mean, they're good businessmen. Why are they good businessmen? Because they're careful. They're careful with their money. They take their time. They're not going to go and, you know, put every, something on the whole farm. They're going to try it. They're going to look at it. So to me, when you're adding technology, you have to, like, work within that paradigm. The paradigm is that, you know, the barrier to entry has to be low enough and the risk has to be low enough that, in fact, it's easy for them to see how it works on their farm, for them to integrate it into their system. Because while they're businessmen, they all have different business systems, and they need to integrate what you're trying to offer in the system. So I think when we talk about how we take technology and apply it to the field, it's, it's really this, this this connection between how do you take this research and make it accessible to a businessman and show the businessman that this is going to actually improve their business. By the way, water's easy. I, I don't want to say it's easy. Water's easy because I have government regulations who are driving farmers to measure water. Okay, so there's an external driver for my business, so it's a little bit easy, but when you have something like my soil microbes where there's no, you know, the driver is gonna be more yield or something, that's a much more difficult, you know, model. My model's a little bit easier to, a little bit easier, although, you know, on the farmer side, he's not always happy that he's being told to, like, you know, grow his crop with 12 inches of water, and, you know, I can understand why. It's not an easy thing to do and still make money. But I think, you know, the key is that we have to, if, when you start 
when you start looking at technologies, moving technologies to the field, this is really the key point. It's about business. You know, people talk about what is the key point. The key point is this is about business. And, and that's, where, that's where I'll end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, before I get started, I want to I want to thank obviously the University of Nebraska and and uh, and and the conference organizers. Wonderful opportunity to uh, hear from a lot of talented people. Um, as much as anything, what I want to try to do is paint a vision, if you will, where culture is headed in some. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that private-public partnership. Um, the military talks about technology readiness levels. And generally, universities have always operated in the one to three region, if you will. Basic science, basic research. Um, if you look at the private sector, they're operating in the uh, seven through nine levels, if you will. They're creating products and selling them for profit. The gap, which is a bit problematic, is really the four, five, and six technology levels. And that's pre-production or before it goes to the marketplace. What we've been doing at Ohio State is we've been finding opportunities in that space in some respects. Um, I'll also recognize what's going on at the University of Nebraska with the Innovation Campus because I think universities are finding opportunities to move into that kind of center space where there hasn't been necessarily a lot of people. And so I'm going to talk as much about anything about some of our partnerships that have been ongoing at Ohio State, but I also want to kind of paint a vision where I think some of this is headed in terms of the technology. Um, well, I'm going to take that back. Not, not Iowa State University, but rather the Ag State Task Force in the state of Iowa, which is made up of commodity groups, um, did a study on big data and agriculture. Okay? Out of that study came out this new term, digital agriculture. And, uh, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people and, 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 and talk about what that means, but the way I like to think about it in some respects, precision agriculture is what we did in all, maybe a few hundred fields, whereas digital agriculture is what we're going to do on a, four, a few hundred thousand fields. And the reason why I think that's important is um, increasingly what we're doing is, is we're connecting agricultural production to the Internet. Okay? I happen to think it's the fourth revolution in agriculture in some respects. And so people might argue with me about that, but, but I think it's happening. I like this slide because everybody talks about the Internet of Things. Well, what is the Internet of Things? And uh, the, the numbers that I like on this, if you go out to 2018, what, we have about uh, 18 billion Internet-connected devices. You know, in a world of seven, seven and a half billion people, that means everybody has several devices. And uh, the one example I like to use when I'm talking to people is my graduate student holds up his smartphone, and there's a little dial for a thermostat on his smartphone. He goes, watch this, and he dials it back. My brother's at home. He goes, there's nothing he can do about what I just did to that environment, Okay. <laughs> which is a great example about Internet-connected devices. The thermostat was connected to the Internet in this case, and he'd control the, the temperature of the home. Well, if you look at personal computers across the bottom, about 2 billion devices. Smartphones, about 3 billion. You, you know, being in East Africa, <laughs> wow. You, you look at what the smartphone means to the East Africans and, and how much of their disposable income, or not really disposable income, they spend on that technology. We've got tablets, we've got the Internet of Things, we've got wearables and, and smart TVs. But what I say to internet right now, and it's in that internet of things. Um, you buy a, a tractor today from John Deere over 200 horse, it automatically comes inter internet connected, okay? And we're going to see much more of that. I'm an engineer, so I like flow charts, and uh, you, you know, the, the, the first individual. Oh. Are we up yet? Okay. Well, I'll, there we go. Okay. So, so anyways, I like this flow chart because what it suggests is, and I know there's a lot of detail on it, but we're kind of closing the loop on agricultural production. We're going to sample during the growing season. We're going to do that by densifying the sensor network, if you will, on the equipment going through the field as well as in the field. And, and our previous uh, panelists just talked about 
one of the things they're doing in terms of uh, soil moisture. I like this thought in some respects because for quite some time, agriculture was kind of done in an open loop fashion. The farmer would make their cropping plans, they'd execute them. At the end of the season, they check their books at the end of the year, and that's the way they made decisions how they were going to manage the following year. I'm suggesting we're going to do that during the growing season, and I think moving real example of that real-time management of, of cropping inputs. And I think that's going to occur because of some of the lawsuits that are currently going on, um, and I'm going to point to the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit in sp uh, specific detail. Um, I like this one. I'm not selling products for anyone, but DTN obviously is one of those organizations that's densifying the network of uh, weather sensors, if you will. And, and they're a company that's probably doing it substantially. All right, we'll do it the old-fashioned way. Um, but, but if you look, and, and the private sector is densifying those sensor networks. We watched the, the, the National Weather Service attempt to do this, and they got fair along, uh, a fair ways along the, the road, if you will. But obviously, it's the farmers, the people that need to know that data, are the ones that are wanting it. I, I mentioned tractors that come internet-connected, okay? There's now about six or seven, maybe eight or nine different telematics devices. Um, I like the farm mobile device. Again, I'm not selling anybody's telematics, but I pulled it out of the box, and the graduate, well, actually, the graduate student pulled it out of the box, handed it to me, and goes, here, Dr. Sher, I think you can install this. <laughs> it had one plug. I figured out where that plug was. The other thing is I had to figure out how to put the suction cups on the back. I stuck it to the window on the inside of the tractor, and it was working, okay? That tractor was internet connected, and it was transmitting data the minute I started the engine on that tractor, okay? All kinds of information um, going to the cloud, if you will. Um, some of my colleagues and I, we sat down one day and we said, well, how much data is going to the cloud? For North American agriculture, about a half a kilobyte per corn plant. And I was in a, I was in a meeting one day, and somebody looked at me and said, Dr. Shear, what, what's, what's a half a kilobyte per corn plant? Put that in terms that I can understand. And so I did a little bit of math and came back, and basically, that's like an acre of corn sending you 9,000 email messages during the growing season, Okay. And I think that's significant in that that's happening on a routine basis today. You know, this is not something we're talking about, you know, light years away or something like that. This, this is something that's ongoing today, and there are a lot of people attempting to aggregate that information. And at last count, about 40 different organizations in this country that want to aggregate that data for farmers, many of them in the private sector. One of the other things is we're densifying sensor networks on field machinery. And uh, we watched what precision planting did. They kind of redefined precision seeding, if you will. Um, I like this one. <laughs> it's a map of nearly the location of every seed that was planted. Okay? The reds are skips and the blues are doubles. Think about our ability now to track the inputs going into agricultural production. Um, the new technology that everybody's excited about, that's multi-hybrid. We're going to put two different hybrids on the planter as we move through the field, we're going to switch locations. Now, if you're doing seeding under center pivots and you have those corners that are typically dry land farm versus those that are irrigated, it makes sense to change hybrids. But I think in even the rain-fed locations, we're looking at how maybe changing hybrids within the soil landscape might benefit producers. And obviously, we're not changing the cost structure much at all, notwithstanding the equipment. By the way, what we're seeing is in some of the data coming out that uh, you may be able to retire the cost of the equipment about a year, year and a half in terms of the multi-hybrid seating arrangements. Um, I like remote sensing. I think when you couple it with data collection on the ground, you have something that's very powerful. Okay? And, and so here is a remote sensed image. Uh, this was actually um, uh, a man piloted aircraft in, in terms of collecting the image. But this is a multi-hybrid field, and, and it's kind of interesting now because under the ADVI image, which is one of those vegetative indices, it begins showing us regions of the field that are more stressed than others in terms of that growing season. So again, going back and, and marrying the machine-based data, which hybrid was seeded and where it was seeded, and then looking at some of these maps during the growing season really have some potential in terms of where things might head. Um, Everybody tells me that precision planting is, has basically redefined seeding operations, and I won't disagree with that. 
And, and I, I talked to a lot of farmers. They said, well, all the, everything's been done that can possibly be done in, in terms of managing that seed that goes in the ground. Um, I like this coming out of Oklahoma State. They were orienting the seed with the axis of it normal to the furrow and beginning to control the crop leaf or the canopy architecture of the corn plant. Now, in some of their tests, and again, this is in a bit more of an arid region, they were seeing about a 14 to 15 percent increase in yield in some of their test plots. Whether or not that is sustained or not, I don't know. But, but it's interesting. Um, working with an agronomist at Ohio State, he tells me if you put the embryo side of the seed down in the furrow, much more uniform emergence rates. So, so we're just kind of on the cusp of really understanding a lot of what's going on in terms of agricultural production. Uh, one of my colleagues started out at the beginning and said, sometimes engineers, uh, you know, fix things that aren't broken. What I always say is engineers do things because they can, not necessarily because anybody wants them or it's necessarily needed. But the wonderful thing is people flying over central Ohio knew who was farming this field this summer, okay? And this is an example. These are two different hybrids, and uh, one has a very um, erect leaf structure, if you will, straight up. And the other, the other hybrid has kind of a floppy leaf structure to it. And if you look at the way they capture and transmit uh, sunlight, uh, absorb sunlight, if you will, obviously it translates to the reflectance in those, in those plants. Uh, somebody told me, uh, Archie, that if that would have been an N, it would have been more profitable, okay? <laughs> so we've, uh, I talk about technology, and I'm thinking to myself, why could you possibly want or need technology on a grain cart? Okay? It does one thing. It takes grain from the combine to the truck waiting at the road. Okay? Well, I think there's some real value in this data. The first thing is, once you unload the combine into the grain cart, you can automatically calibrate your uh, yield monitor. And you can do that every time you unload. That improves the quality of the yield monitor data, if you will. If you also look at where the grain cart's been, you also, also know which areas of the, the field are likely more compacted. In that central region of the field, the little red dot down at the bottom is where the truck was parked. We have locations within that field that were trafficked 30 and 35 times with loaded grain carts. Do you think there's any soil structure problems in those regions of the field? By the way, that grain cart loaded was well over 50 tons. You know, everybody talks about soil compaction, soil structure. I, I think it's a very interesting and unique time. Um, I like this one. What, uh, a couple of our speakers talked about unmanned aerial systems and, and what it's going to mean. Um, I don't really care whether it's manned flight, unmanned flight, or even satellite imagery. It's going to change the way we do agriculture in some respects. We're projecting that that data um, generation rate could be as high as 5 kilobytes per corn plant per growing season. So now we're into the 90,000 emails. Uh, for each acre of corn in some respects. I like watching companies like Planet Labs. Um, kind of a unique platform, if you will. When they launch satellites now, they, they launch about 25 at a time. They're CubeSats. Right now, I believe they have a constellation in orbit of about 113 of these. But next year, they'll be fully capable or fully operational. I think it's somewhere around 250 satellites, if I'm not mistaken. My point in all this is maybe the resolution isn't great, but the availability of data is going to be substantial in terms of what's coming from what Planet Lab's doing. Um, whether anybody else picks up and begins doing similar things, the reality is that, that it's cost effective to do so right now, and there could be some business models that are pretty interesting. One of my colleagues was talking about hyperspectral, and all I'm looking at is the cost of hyperspectral cameras come down, and even the, the, the size of them come down. So maybe we begin flying them so, at some point in time on unmanned aerial systems. Um, I like showing this one, and, and this is one of those things that's kind of a public-private partnership, but this was done uh, with the Air Force Research Laboratory outside of Dayton, Ohio, and uh, Precision Planting was involved in it, Case IH was involved in it, but it was one of those things that when the project kind of started, we didn't really know where it was headed in some respects, but we got to a point after the Air Force Research Laboratory supported a student, we were able to do stand counts on plants at the second leaf stage as they come out of the ground. And when you start looking at this imagery and you begin looking at some of the data in terms of where the seeds went into the ground at, it begins telling some pretty interesting stories in terms of what's going on in that field. The question is, how do we translate this into management decisions that are meaningful and make farmers money? And again, I think that's where that public-private partnership becomes very important in terms of trying to ferret out the value in some of these technologies. 
Uh, I mentioned the Des Moines Water Works. The reason why that's important is uh, the gentleman at the Des Moines Water Works who filed suit basically alleges that water moving into the soil profile and down into the tile drains becomes a point source pollutant. Think about the implications. If the Des Moines Water Works lawsuit is successful, essentially the EPA will regulate tile drainage outlets going into surface waters and think about the implications. Um, what I like to think about in some respects are what are some of the things that are going to be done differently. If you look in, in, in Iowa in some respects, there's still a mentality that I put anhydrous ammonia on in the fall, plant the next year's crop, and keep my fingers crossed that there's enough nitrogen to take the crop through to, to harvest or maturity, if you will. I'd say those days are behind us in some respects, and, and I point to this as an example. Uh, this is where the nitrogen management models that a lot of the companies are coming up with, coupled with remote sensing imagery, coupled with new capabilities in terms of nitrogen placement, change the game. And uh, in this case right here, what, what, the, what I want to point out is in this region, uh, maybe I won't get that on. Um, I'll point to this region right here. This region right here is actually a nitrogen plot. And uh, that's a visible image, but when you go to the red edge image, you find that one of those plots is, is significantly deficient in nitrogen compared to the other plots. And the reason why this is so important is, I think we're going to go to in-season management end. We have a lot of equipment now that will allow us to apply nitrogen after tassel. And so when I talk about late season nitrogen application, this is after the ear begins to form. And we see potential value in that in terms of how we space out nitrogen application. Um, I won't try to explain this entire bar chart, but this case right here, this kind of lighter blue, we put nitrogen on the planter, we side dressed it about V6 or V7, and then we came in with late season N application. When you look at the profitability, and that's what those bars are, the light blue in every case, and that's units of N on planter at the bottom, 10, 40, and 70. But in every case, the most profitable was managing nitrogen at all three times during the growing season. Now, the other thing you need to know is we cut nitrogen management costs in half for that light blue bar. Again, last year in Ohio, though, 2015 was a pretty challenging year in terms of managing nitrogen. But again, if we, if we begin applying that nitrogen closer to when the crop's going to take up that nitrogen, hopefully what that translates into is less in the way of off-site movement of some of those nutrients. State of Ohio, we have uh, Lake Erie and dissolved reactive phosphorus, which is very problematic. Um, this is another thing we got started with the Air Force, CNH and, uh, and uh, Precision Planting slash Climate Corp. It's kind of hard to tell who we're working with sometimes, but, but anyways, what I like is using remote sensed imagery, combining it with machine-based data to do things that we never thought possible before. This is a soil compaction plot, and you can see diagonally wheel traffic events created with a grain cart. And uh, that's a cornfield. Here we have the yield monitor data coming off the combine at harvest. And if you look at that yield monitor data, the resolution of it is such that we've lost, if you will, the yield reduction due to the grain cart passes. However, if we marry, if you will, and this is, uh, there was, I, I think we did a, about a V12 vegetative state with the yield monitor data in terms of the remote sensed imagery, we end up creating this yield map, which now allows us to go in and ferret out what the true loss to that farmer was in terms of soil compaction events. And, and so I think it's marrying the technologies together that really moves us down the road in terms of what's, uh, what's going on. Um, Archie wanted to talk, talk about scale a little bit and, and how we see this unfolding in some respects. Here is a, an Internet of Things uh, world distribution. And as most people might suspect, North America and Western Europe, obviously, um, uh, a lot of internet connected devices. The real question is, is what's going to happen in Africa, which it's kind of hard to make out right here, <laughs> in terms of uh, th this internet of things and agricultural productivity. Well, I think there is some hope because when I was in East Africa, one of the things I discovered pretty quickly was I had four and five bars most of the time on my cell phone and, and I dropped calls all the time in Northwest Ohio. And so I see some evolving technology in a lot of other countries that, that is actually going to shape this uh, quite, uh, quite readily. The real question is, 
Is it going to be Ethernet or Wi-Fi? And I think everybody would admit we're rapidly moving towards a Wi-Fi type environment for uh, transmission of data. And for developing countries, that's going to be a very good thing. I like talking about this a little bit. These are John Deere tractors produced between uh, 1920 and 2010. These are ballasted tractor weights as they were tested here at the University of Nebraska. Anybody see anything about that that would concern them? If you look at the slope of that green line, the increase in the largest tractors produced by John Deere, the increase in the ballasted weight of the tractors produced by John Deere, the largest tractors, has increased 900 pounds per year now, sustained for over 50 years. Hmm. Do you think we have a soil compaction problem? I want to show you these two tractors. The one on the left, a two-wheel drive with front wheel assist. Fent is producing this in Europe now, 500 horse. Um, quad track, if you will, or a track tractor produced by CNH, 685 horse. The important thing is when you look at these tractors, you have to have 120 pounds of ballasted tractor mass for every engine horsepower. And if you stop and think about it, we have tractors now approaching 80,000 pounds. It's to the point where they'll have to be disassembled to be shipped. Okay? I see nothing stemming the tide in terms of bigger tractors, notwithstanding perhaps automation and going back to fully autonomous equipment or going to fully autonomous equipment. And when I think about something being scale neutral, I think of a tractor that's 50 or 60 horse being much more scalable if you look at it on a worldwide basis in comparison to many of the tractors today being produced that are five or 600 horse. And so if we look at the capitalization of agriculture in some different regions of the world, there may be some true opportunities with the automation. Now, I realize it's a, a sea change in technology, but I also look at the cell phone and what it's meant in the developing world as well and how people are using that um, to, to access markets as well as, as data and a lot of other things. So, what's driving all this? I tell people, um, it used to be we couldn't afford technology, and so we never really thought about how to use it. Today, technology is available and widely available at a very cost-effective price, but the other thing is we're really limited today by our imagination in some respects. This is kind of a three-plane diagram that talks a little bit about some of the basic technologies, some of the, the, the platforms in terms of how things are being developed, and then really when we begin looking at the test beds, what's happening within industry to integrate some of these sensor technologies and some of the crop models and some of the remote sensed imagery and things like that into closing the loop in production agriculture. So uh, again, quite a bit to, to absorb there in some respects, but we're moving increasingly towards closing the loop on production agriculture. So with that, I guess I'm done. Thank you very much. Well, we covered a lot of ground. Thanks very much to the speakers. Um, I think what I'll do at this time, just to make sure that you have plenty of time to bring your questions to the panel, I'll, I'll open it up. We have mics. I know there's one over here on this side of the room. There may be another point. So if you have questions and want to start moving that direction, we'll open the floor. I'll, I'll, as you're doing that, or as we enter into discussion, I'll put a question out here for the panel that's a, a different aspect than I think the other topics we've talked about today, but it's one that came up during the meeting yesterday, and that's around workforce development uh, and the, the needs, the great needs that will be there for um, workforce that has the right technical skills to meet global food security challenges. Uh, so I'm interested in that output end of that pipeline, but in this case in particular, thinking about the opportunities to enhance that pipeline, to bring people, to bring students, for example. We talk a lot here on this campus about, with our proximity to 25,000 students or perhaps 20,000 students who know little about agricultural technology, how can we draw students, how can we draw people into career paths in agriculture that they might not otherwise consider? And we've just talked about some really cool technology across a, 
a wide range. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about are you seeing more attention to these kinds of technologies and career paths or how we can leverage the technology to, to draw more people this direction? So here, I'll, I'm, I want to start only because I actually have an answer, which I don't always. Uh, uh, one thing, and I'm not telling you how to do this, okay, but I think one thing that's important, and you know, I've been in academics, you know, I, I did my doctorate, I have a bunch of publications, very old, but you know, but one thing that I think is really important is that everything is sales. I don't care if, you know, actually, my major advisor was the best salesman I ever knew. Okay, he sold his ideas, he sold grants, but he was great. And I, I think one thing that, that students coming out, I hear so many guys, I don't do sales. I don't know how to do sales. I don't know how to, I'm sorry, everything is sales. Okay, your whole life is sales, whether you're selling your ideas, whether you're selling something, and the, the more you learn that, the more you can integrate into many different, you've brought in your range of opportunities. That's all, that's my only point, is, is the key is to be able to broaden where you go. You know, where, where you start is never where you're gonna end, and you wanna make sure you have a broad, well, unless you happen to get a nice professorship when you're young and, and just stay on. But other than that, me, I can tell you, I've been everywhere. Um, I had an opportunity to be with the Vice President of uh, Case IH um, several weeks ago. And the interesting dialogue that, that kind of came up is they're, they're hiring um, CS majors to develop apps for agriculture. And the problem inherently that they have is the developers don't really understand agriculture well enough to be effective at app development in, the, in this environment in some respects. And so we, we kind of have a situation where we're facing the reality of, are we going to teach students in colleges of agriculture who understand agriculture? Are we going to teach them how to program and develop apps? Or are we going to teach computer science majors enough agriculture, if you will, so that they can be effective as computer programmers developing apps for the, for the ag sector. I, I'd like to think there are opportunities within universities to co-educate some of these students and put them in an environment that, that is a little bit more lifelike than, than some of the things that we do in classrooms. Um, th this idea of sales, I think, is critical. And, and again, I think universities need to be moving to this, these technology ready, readiness levels, if you will, in the four to six region. And I think one of the things that maybe should help is if some of our educational programs move in the same direction. You know, most of the students I talk with, the, the question always comes up, um, which company are you going to work for when you graduate? I'd like to be thinking, uh, which, which company are you going to start upon graduation? And getting students thinking about being entrepreneurs more so than, than just focusing solely on the, silent, uh, the science or the discipline that they happen to be enrolled in. Any other thoughts on that? topic before we move on. Well, I was going to say, Archie, that, you know, when I used to be a hiring person, a manager, it took about a year before the engineer, the computer scientist I hired, was really productive because they didn't know the technology, they didn't know the, how to work within a team, and they didn't know what was important. And I don't know how, whether that's still true or not. It's been a while since I've been away from that. But I think there's a real opportunity for collaborations to get part of the way there. I have uh, two graduate students. One is in computer science and one's in uh, uh, our area, School of Natural Resources, and they're working together on a NASA project. One's bringing the computer science knowledge, the other one's bringing the knowledge of our domain. And they're both learning, and they're both learning about the other side. So I think it, doing things like that are a real opportunity to develop people who can go out into the world and be productive. I'll, I'll just add, um, you know, I think one of the things that, um, one of the mistakes we make as academics at universities is we train people for a very kind of narrow band of knowledge. And so, you know, one way to attract more students is, you know, you know I think the microbiome is the coolest thing in the world to study, but I don't think that necessarily when they're going to graduate that, um, you know, a graduate student's going to find a job in that field. So, so I really think it's important to, you know, uh, train people to, to um, have other skills as well. You know, people skills, soft skills, 
Um, I think, you know, for people in my lab, I want everybody in the lab to be able to do the computational work and also to do the wet lab biology to understand how to design field experiments. So I think, you know, perhaps the broad-based training may be one attractive um, selling point to, you know, bring more students into, into this area of agriculture. Thanks. Question over here. Right? So Archie, thanks. Um, this is a great panel discussion, and especially for me because I'm kind of farm ignorant. Okay, I don't know a lot about farming and hydrology and soils and blah blah blah. But it's really cool. I've worked on biotechnology and the safety assessment of genetically engineered crops for some time at Monsanto and here. And one of the things that, and I'm I'm not really trying to criticize the meeting or the people here. But one of the things that I see missing is we have technologies that also seem to overlap insect pressure, disease resistance, disease management, and those are real critical in, I think, in North America, all over the world. They're different, and the, and the pests that we're dealing with are different. I work, you know, we're kind of missing what is the technology of the genome of the plant, what is the technology of the, you know, related to pests and to things like late blight in potatoes and bacteria in bananas and we have rust development coming back because we're having changing things. So how can we marry the technology of watching soil, water, nitrogen, those are clearly important, with how do we improve in different, very different systems, disease management of large scale farming in North America and other places with maybe places in Africa and, and help to get the yields that we need to have good efficient food production. All right, so I'm, I, I can't answer the question genetics wise or anything else, but to give you an idea of technology, so one of the things, actually one of the toys that, that we're playing with, I call it a toy because it is right now, but you know, once we have this hub that's connected to the cloud, we actually have a little clip-on sensor that measures the diameter of the plant. And actually, each of our sensors has a Bluetooth. So you just need a very inexpensive Bluetooth. So you just put this very inexpensive clip-on sensor. We measure the diameter of the plant. And, and we can actually, that, that diameter will change if the plant's stressed, water stressed. We can compare the water stress on the plant to, the, to what the soil moisture is and actually develop an index. To your thing on disease, that same sensor actually measures wetness. And so we can actually then start looking at developing disease predictive models based on surface moisture wetness and, and actually start looking at disease models. Now, I'm not saying that this is, doesn't answer your question. It certainly doesn't answer the question and the bigger things. But, but I think you know, the focus, it's not that people aren't thinking about these other factors. In fact, they're, probably, they're more important to everyday farmers than water. As a matter of fact, I always say, a farmer only wants to spend 1% one, one of his time, I, I sometimes say 5% of his time, thinking about water. He spends most of his time thinking about disease, insects, you know, these are the things that bother. And actually, the price of the crop and how he's going to sell it is where he spends most of his time. So, I mean, these are critical factors, but I, I, I think our focus doesn't actually preclude those. Those things are in there. It's just that because of the, the focus of the conference, that's what we talk about. I'm going to make a comment that's... Uh, um, a little bit different in some respects, when uh, limited travels in, in, in terms of developing countries, but one of the things that, that I always get to is when I get to the country, I, I see the obvious things that you could easily do. But then you, you think and you learn about some of the social challenges that, that, that are faced to do those sort of things. And uh, I'm reminded of when we look in Tanzania, a lot of relief organizations have gone in and drilled wells. You go back two or three years later and that well is no longer functioning. And, and, and so... When, when we look at um, how agriculture is going to proceed in some of these countries, um, th there's going to be technology that's appropriate for today, but, but as that society continues to develop in that country, that technology, those technological needs are going to change in some respects. And so the real question is, and I think when you look at it kind of a little bit more holistically, 
what sort of technologies are appropriate for the given time, and, and as that com uh, country continues to develop and move along in, in terms of whatever the main driving force might be, when I look in East Africa, a lot of it's just simply capitalization and, and the ability um, or, or the lack of ability to, to uh, invest in some of the technologies. But um, you think about appropriate technologies and then moving that country forward in terms of adding technologies as appropriate as time goes along. I don't know whether that makes a lot of sense or not, but I never, and, until you've been there, you never really appreciate the, the implications of the social structure within the country in, in, in terms of what's going to be adopted or what's going to be used and, and how agriculture is going to move forward. Another question? Yeah, this question is for Daniel primarily. Um, the, the things that we're discovering about uh, soil microbiomes and the interactions with plants just mind-boggling and really cool to, to uh, read about. Um, so my question to you is, what, what's the number one thing, you, thing you, that you think we're doing to the detriment of microbial populations? Or to ask it another way, what's the number one thing maybe that we could change to benefit? Well, um, yeah, so I, I don't actually have a very good answer to the question, but, you know, I, I think there's, there, from the talks that I've gone to, you know, there are people that um, feel that soil diversity is really critical. Um, and then when you go to um, more industrial agriculture, you may reduce the diversity. Um, you know, I'm not exactly positive that that's true. You know, you definitely shift what's happening in the ecological landscape of the soils. So, um, you know, when you, when you go to agriculture, maybe there's less diversity uh, than a natural system. That doesn't necessarily make it bad, per se. Um, but, you know, I, I think we really have a lot to, more to understand, I think, before we can say what's good and bad in terms of soil microbial populations. Um, you know, I can just tell you a little bit, you know, about the limited work that we've done with, with fertilizers. Uh, you know, you see shifts in microbial populations, but I don't necessarily think it's a necessarily good or bad thing. Uh, so I think it's kind of a tough question. I will continue to think about what the answer to that could be, but um, yeah, I, I don't really have a good, good answer for you today. And then a second question, to more to the group. Um, um, you know, it seems like big data, there's, it almost seems like it takes a team of consultants for a farmer to be able to use that to benefit his operation. You know, you've got to talk to several different people to, to be able to integrate it all together. And what I thought was really cool about what CropX is doing is that seems like it's such a simplified system for a single user um, to implement. And so I guess kind of to bring out maybe the futurists in you, do you see out in the future ways to simplify big data for small holders um, to use in their operations? Well, that is the key. You know, I mean, again, I, I like to look at what, how much mental energy is going to be spent to manage your farm. And so it has to be you know, actionable data, and because, not because, far, that, you know, that because the farming season is very, is relatively short, and you have to have actionable data at your fingertips. So I think the key with big data, now, there are, you know, certain aspects of, of, of what you were talking about is that you analyze after the season, you can look at things, so there you can spend more time, but if you're looking at real-time action, you know, that's, that's actually one of the tricks of commercializing big data is how do you give actionable data, you know, uh, quickly and, and, and easily, you know, that doesn't take much time to think about. I think this is really the trick. Other questions? Let me, <clears throat> I don't see anyone up at the mics. Let me put another um, a little bit broader question out that you've you've touched on in a lot of ways, but maybe to draw out some some concluding thoughts around this point, we work to build strategy here that recognizes even at a basic research level we need to um, build that 
scaling up process from basic research through translational from from greenhouse research to small plot and field research. Um, we understand the importance of commercialization in delivering impacts. Precision agriculture seems to represent uh, a, a game-changing area of technology in terms of that translation to field to field scale and conventional scale agriculture and partnerships with farmers. Thinking about the partnerships that are necessary across that spectrum, any additional thoughts about opportunities that you still see ahead of you uh, in building partnerships and challenges or barriers to those partnerships? Oh. I'll just kind of put a thought out there in, in, in terms of some of the relationships we've established at Ohio State, and I, I think this would be typical of any land-grant institution, per, perhaps. You know, we've done a lot of on-farm work for a number of years as academic institutions, but what we're finding real value in is working with the crop consultants and them identifying the farmers to work with. And it's a bit of a different structure than we've had before because usually it was up to a researcher to go out and find that participating farmer in some respects. We're also kind of finding a, a nexus, if you will, of working with the crop consultants, engaging the farmers, but also having the private sector in the room at the same time. And, and so it's been a, di a bit of a different model in terms of even how we fund research in, in some respects, part of it coming from the private sector and part of it actually coming from the farmers who participate. So a bit of a different approach. All right, other thoughts, questions? If not, I... I we have a question. Oh, sorry, yeah, please. Thanks for the great panel discussion. Uh, yeah, I have a question about investment, how the farmer invests of the new technology. I mean, the new technology most likely will increase the crop yield and the crop productivity, but it's also require additional investment costs. It can be reduced or maybe increase the cost but farmer also facing the uncertainty in price and the volatility in price. So what do you talk about? How farmers should uh, adapt to the new technology, but they are also facing the risks of the volatility in the crop price. Thank you. I didn't understand that. Well, so, I, I think what you were talking about is the, the, the cost of integrating technology into an operation given the relatively low value of some of the commodity prices. And it's more of a challenge today, certainly, than it was with $8 corn in some respects. Um, the, the, the way that I would respond, and I talk to a lot of farmers in Ohio, um, they can't possibly be an expert in all areas of their operations. And so what I tell them to do is pick two or three things they're really good at, and then go out and purchase the other services. Now the question becomes, are you going to get a benefit from purchasing that service? And I think that's, that's really where the management uh, aspect comes in, in terms of how they're going to do that. Um, we know that a lot of farmers like to be out driving their tractors around in some respects, when in reality, they ought to be sitting at their desk marketing their grain and getting a better price for it, okay? Um, I don't think all farmers are going to be control all phases of their operations like they used to because of some of the technology that's coming along. But, but again, in some cases, I think it makes sense for farmers just to purchase the technology either by subscribing to a service, going through a crop consultant, or however they choose to, to get access to that service. I think it also buys down their cost of participating in it because they don't have to develop those capabilities necessarily in-house. In some ways, actually, that's like following what's happening with business in general. I mean, you know, people, you know, companies are using contractors, okay, instead of, so HR, actually, my company, you know, we, we actually hire out an HR firm that does all payroll, handles all of the legal, rec, you know, stuff and everything. And so in some ways, farmers are, have to kind of move to that area as their business gets more complex is they have to look at these services, which in many, many times could be more efficient for them. And by the way, they've already done this because they've already, they already do things like custom harvesting and you know, so a lot of guys now, because of the seeders are so expensive, do custom seeding, they hire seeding companies. So I think they're already moving in that direction to kind of you know, where they don't have the expertise or the funds, they actually can, can actually farm, you know, farm that out to companies that specialize in that aspect of the business. 
So uh, from the Nebraska perspective, uh, this is a state that still has a very strong extension um, group, uh, very active. And so what this allows us to do as researchers um, you know, at the universities, uh, we're able to kind of team up with farmers and basically test things on their farm. And so you know, from a farmer's point of view, I'm not sure I'd always want to be an early adopter of all this technology because it may not pan out. But if you can get an extension person or a, you know, a public person to come on to your farm and test that and show that it works under your conditions. I mean, this is another thing about farming is that um, you know, every field seems to be a bit different from the next. And, and so you can't really guarantee that things are going to work. But if you can engage the public researchers to um, help you test things, I, I think that will lower the cost of entry uh, to some of these technologies. Now let me mention something a little bit off the wall here. One of the things that Nebraska does that's kind of interesting is we have a tractor test facility. And it was created many, many long years ago. I think it was a state senator who bought a tractor who didn't come up to his specs, and he got very upset, and he asked that the university do something about that. So the university created a tractor test facility, and that facility still exists, still certifies tractors for manufacturers all over the world. One of the things in remote sensing, as I said, there were a gazillion indices. And one of my problems in this field is if you read a paper in remote sensing, they test something, and they give you about 50 indices and say, this is how well it worked. Well, that doesn't help you from the standpoint of saying, I need to go measure out the amount of chlorophyll in my field or the, the gross primary production. I had to pick this one. There's nobody that will tell you that. In terms of the uh, drone manufacturers and in terms of the hyperspectral manufacturers, they're coming to us and saying, tell us what to do. And they're also saying, OK, we think we can do this. Would you confirm it for us? And what we're missing here, I think, in, with this new technology is some sort of certification authority. Somebody who says, this really works, and you ought to try it. Now, as they did with the tractors, maybe it's time for universities to step in, up and say, OK, here's another opportunity for us. Well, I think we ended up, again, emphasizing the importance of partnerships and a lot of different disciplines coming together to, to solve these problems. I want to thank all of you for your attendance and participation today, and especially want to thank this panel for sharing their expertise and perspectives. So please join me in thanking.